Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. This will be my last video for a while, so I thought I'd show you what I'm working on. What are we looking at? Well, this is a Python script which samples the digital audio from the PC's microphone, runs an FFT on it, places it into the frequency band buckets, and sends it on to an ESP32. Here we can see the actual audio buckets as they're formed from left to right from low to high frequency, and they're being done with the NumPy library under Python. That runs an FFT, which then buckets the data and sends it on to the ESP32. Here we can see the ESP32 itself receiving the data over Wi-Fi. Here it's getting the first four band peaks and printing those out. And we can see those are then sent on to the actual LED matrix display, which shows us up here the display of the current audio graph. Everything on the PC side is done via a simple Python script and then sent via Wi-Fi in a socket by custom marshalling the data and all the information and sending it on to the ESP32. We'll take a look at the code later on, see how it actually works. Here's a ton of PDP-11 hardware, which will eventually become my PDP-11, but let's take a look around the shop and see what's going on. Over in the middle of the shop, we've got a bunch of retro hardware, starting off with a couple of PET 2001s. This is the Amber PET that we built a couple episodes ago. It uh, currently is featuring a fully mechanical Cherry MX keyboard that I've built. Works great, however, I've got to space it up to get it to actually fit. I started with a circuit board from Texelec and then custom printed on my 3D printer all of these little adapters that adapt the original PET keys to the Cherry MX key bases. You can see the PET sits next to a massive 10 megabyte Commodore D9090 hard drive, as well as an SFT 1.2 megabyte quad density floppy disk. There's also a Apple II and a chiclet machine. Now here's my Telstar rebuild of Pong. You can see that it works pretty well. It's connected to a plasma monitor that is, uh, well, it's old, it's 70 inches, and it was $17,000 when it was brand new in 2006, so it's not going anywhere. Facing those are an original IBM 5160 XT running MS-DOS 6.22, which I worked on, so it's my favorite. Next to that is an IBM PS2 Model 55SX featuring a 386SX PC at, I believe, 16 megahertz running Windows 3.11 for workgroups. And because used keyboards are gross, it features a brand new Model M fresh from the NOS box. And this is a neon sign I had custom made for my friend Jim Preston, who's since passed away. He was in his 70s and he was a genius mechanic for anything built before 1975. I managed to get the sign back after his passing and unfortunately a tube died on it, so I replaced all the transformers to no avail. Eventually I had to send it out to have the uh, tube rebuilt and regassed, but unfortunately other stuff broke during shipment which meant that I had to send it to Noble Neon here in Seattle, who did a great job at rebuilding it from scratch. Normally, I'm just a big fan of LEDs, but I love the bright primary colors of neon signs, and so I have a number of them in the shop as well. This is my E46 M3 SMG Cabriolet BMW. I bought it brand new in 2003. It now has 14,000 miles and absolutely no modifications. There's a lot of these cars around, but not many that have not been modified, so this one is rather unique. And speaking of unique, this is my 1969 Pontiac 2 Plus 2 427, a model that was discontinued in 1967 in the States, but continued on till 69 in Canada. When I turned 16 back in 84, it became my first car, and it's still got the exact same license plate that it had in 1969. I also have a convertible 427 version of this car. It's currently off in restoration and should be back sometime this year after six years off in Wisconsin being restored. And this is my 1970 GMC Sierra Grande Custom Camper Longhorn. It's a truck that I restored myself. I did absolutely everything, every nut and bolt in this vehicle except for paint. I did stain the wood myself, but I don't do body work. It's kind of magic. This truck was from its original owner and required no body work other than fresh paint. Let's have a look inside. It has all the options, including tack, tilt, a speed warning dash, air conditioning, buckets, console, and pretty much everything that was available. More importantly, everything works perfectly from the AM FM radio down to the factory AC system that has been converted to R134 refrigerant. Like a vault. This is the factory 396 big block, also known as the 402 in this year, and it has been rebuilt to original factory specs entirely with the flat tappet cam and the original carburetor. Every component is original and restored. Here's the 427 installed in the Pontiac 2 Plus 2, and if you're wondering why it's orange, it's because this car was built in Canada. And in Canada, they use the same chassis and powertrain for both Chevrolet and Pontiac. If you look at the little body tag, it says, made in Canada. 
Using Chevrolet powertrain parts meant that unlike the Pontiacs built in the US, you could get the very rare but optional L36 427 Corvette engine in the full-size passenger car, and that's what this car features. It's largely stock, but as you've noticed, I've upgraded the brakes to full Willwood 4-disc brakes in order to keep a little bit of safety. Here's the interior of the car, featuring the factory 4-speed SICK. The Pontiac was our family car for the first 16 years that we had it, and now on to Tempest. I have all three form factors of Tempest, upright, cabaret, and console. This is the cabaret model, and you'll notice the high score says DFT as the initials. Well, those aren't my initials, so whose are they? Well, let's have a look at the factory high score table and we'll see what it has to say. You see DFT has the first two spots, but he also has the fifth spot with the 10101 factory default score. How does that work? Well, DFT is Dave Thur, the original author of Tempest back in 1980. I bought this machine from a longtime Atari original early employee, and thanks to a couple Christmas parties, Dave Thur had set the high score on the machine, so I won't be touching it. In the random decoration category, my dad played saxophone in a band back in the 50s and 60s, and you can see his performance shirt and his bandstand. My mom managed to dig it up locally and sent it off to me to be stored in the shop here. Now back to the PDP-11 parts. Over here we can see the main system backplane processor and RAM boards that sent to me by David at the Usagi Electric Channel. He's got an awesome channel where he's restored a completely old and original Centurion system as well as he's working on a PDP-11 now, so if you've not checked out or heard of his channel yet, check it out now, USAGI Usagi Electric. I've also collected a number of other parts like the serial breakout board, hard drive controller, serial breakout, ROM board, RAM board, another CPU board, all kinds of parts that when put together should build a pretty impressive PDP-11. All I have now left is the wiring, which seems pretty challenging, but we'll see what I can do. On the far right, you can see the CPU board. Next to that is the Winchester hard drive controller board, and what looks to be perhaps the math coprocessor board. We also have a boot drive formatted for RTS-11. And over here we have my first ESP32 SMD project. This board features an ESP32 Rover processor as well as inputs for audio and remote control, outputs for power, USB-C, debugging, and a whole number of features that I always wish to have on an ESP32 board. It plugs directly into the Hub75 matrix and drives it to display some fairly impressive graphics and displays and little apps. Well, unfortunately, there are still a couple of bugs, and I'm now past the auto router's ability to route every path independently. So if you're a circuit board hero and are any good with Easy EDA, please reach out. Use the web address in the uh, channel information and reach out to me and let me know that you'd like to help because I could probably use it at this point. It'll be super cool when it's ready, featuring all the inline debugging and handy features, including microphones and other features that I have always wished for on an ESP32 board, but I'm still a couple traces away from perfection. Now, as for why I won't be making any episodes in the near future, on Monday I'm going in to have an X-lift procedure, as well as rods and cage put into my lower back. First, they'll go in and they'll take out the disc material that's currently not very happy. In this procedure, they start by going in through the side and they remove any existing disc material that's been crunched away in there. This allows them to avoid the spinal cord, as well as on the other side, the major arteries that run up and down the front of the spine. So they take out the existing disc or much of the material, and then they'll insert a cage of donor disc, which is angled to fit the gap in between my now crushed vertebrae. Space them apart and insert the cage. As the healing procedure begins, they'll also stabilize it with rods that are screwed into the vertebrae themselves to give it some support. And then over time, bone will grow between the two plates and fuse the entire two vertebrae together into one big vertebrae. Now you and I both know that Subscribing to a channel on YouTube doesn't make a lot of difference in what you actually see, but it is essential to the growth of the channel, so since I won't be making a video for a couple of weeks at least, I'd appreciate it if you consider checking that you are subscribed to the channel if you thought you already were, and if you're not, and the PDP-11 and retro hardware stuff and programming sounds interesting to you, that you consider subscribing. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.